Mm, should I start? Yeah, we can start. Uh, Namaskar and a very warm welcome to all of you present here today for this insightful panel discussion on ROS, India's engineering mobile operating system. It is my privilege to welcome all of you to this momentous event organized through the collaborative effort of popular Telegram tech channels sponsored by Xiaomi, the community of Xiaomi. Yes, we are also delighted to have you have brightened tech current, welcome tech trip, and the YouTube extended community and our esteemed media partners. The development of ROS by Jandek Ops marked a significant milestone in, in India's journey towards technological self reliance. This homegrown mobile operating system is a mark of ingenuity and dedication of, of our nation's brightest minds, aligning with the government's vision of Atma Nibhar Bharat. Today, we have the honor of hosting a distinguished panel comprising industry experts, developers, and tech enthusiasts which, who will delve into the technical aspects and merits of Bharat. Their diverse perspectives and experiences will undoubtedly, undoubtedly enrich our understanding and appreciation of this groundbreaking initiative. We are great, truly grateful to our esteemed panelists for their presence and willing to share their knowledge with us. Through so this course, we aim to foster a deep comprehension of Bharavar's capabilities and its potential to revolutionize, revolutionize the mobile computing landscape in India and beyond. Once again, I extend a heartfelt welcome to all of you and I look forward to an insightful and enriching experience. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very good one. 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 Yeah, Hello? Yeah. Yes, hello. Hello, hello. Um, you can please start the introductions. Yes, uh, we can start our introductions. Miguel, you're up. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna go now. So, okay, wait, just a sec. Uh, a very warm welcome, everyone. Today, we have an esteemed group of experts and developers Back in 1997. Miguel, your voice is breaking. Man, Wait, the stream on ATT is not did responding. I did I die? No, I mean the stream. I can't okay. hear anything else. Neither am I, I'm just hearing your voice. Miguel, okay. Just, okay, I'm just, just, just restart and make it short, please. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. So let me restart again. So a very warm welcome, everyone. Today, we have an esteemed group of experts and developers who will share and discuss their perspectives on the technical merits of BarOS. We are extremely honored to have Karthik Ayar, the director of JNK Ops, as our guest panelist with the Barcelor in computer science from the University of Minnesota, Karthik has been a pioneer in the field, founding OOPS Private Limited and partnered with IIT Madras to develop India's first video conferencing over the internet back in 1997 and 1998. Next, let me introduce Mr. Ayan Sinha, an experienced Android framework engineer specializing in MediaTek and Qualcomm kernel development and Android framework bring up. 
Ian is the founder and lead developer at Cypher OS and has extensive experience with OEMs such as Oppo, Filmi, and OnePlus. Joining us is also Mr. Pranav Talmale, a passionate BTEC computer engineering student with a keen interest in custom ROMs and software tinkering. And he is currently exploring game development. We are also honored to have Mr. Gian Paul Estacio, a renowned MediaTek developer from the Philippines who tinkers with real mirror devices, sharing his insights with us today. Moderating our discussion is Mr. Yash Balaji Reddy, a cybersecurity enthusiast with seven years of experience in Android, currently pursuing an MSc in cybersecurity from NFSU. We have a very skilled and accomplished panel, and I'm confident that our collect collective con knowledge and experience will lead to an informative and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, thank you, Miguel, uh, for that brilliant introduction, uh, Mr. Karthik. Uh, we can begin now with the panel discussion. Uh, my first question to you would be, uh, what exactly is bar OS? Uh, we have known about it. Uh, we have read about it on newspapers, on the social media and everything. Uh, can you please elaborate what exactly is bar OS? So the panelists can, and me as well, uh, know about it, clear our doubts on it, please. Okay. Well, thanks guys for this invite. Um, uh, and uh, let me just start by saying that um, uh, the philosophy of bar OS to start with, um, you know, we've been seeing uh, operating systems uh, st start taking over our lives, practically speaking, where we have reached a point today where we don't have any control over the data uh, that we create. We don't have any control over the digital identity uh, that we have. You know, um, for example, if you lose your phone today, um, you know, it becomes very, it becomes practically impossible for you to kind of retrieve your digital life. Uh, you need to prove to an algorithm that you are human. And uh, if you're lucky, you get access to your data back. So um, I would say about uh, four or five years ago, we've been, you know, I mean, we had high hopes for Android when it came out that it was supposed to be an open mobile ecosystem. And uh, we had even higher hopes when uh, you know the iPhone was launched because the original promise was you would have a browser and you'd be able to access all the apps through the browser. Um, but where we are today is uh, we have several walled gardens and uh, we have uh, practically speaking bug tech controlling our lives. So the philosophy behind uh, bar OS is essentially to go back to the basics, you know, uh, OS being just a layer, a very thin layer over the hardware, and uh, that provides access to uh, a uniform API and access to different apps and services around that. So we started by saying that, uh, what is it that we will not do? You know, So the first thing we decided was that uh, OS should not have any apps. You know, Today, when you go and you buy a phone, it comes with about 100 apps, and you don't know which app is doing what and which app is stealing your data, which app is malicious, which app is not. We don't know any of those things, you know. So the first philosophical approach was an app. I mean, an OS must be just that. It should, it's like a warm shell in a, you know, uh, when you buy a house, you buy it without any furniture. You just have roof floors, and then you get to choose what furniture goes into the house. You don't allow other people to decide what, you know, what kind of a, um, furniture you need to have in your house, uh, even if it is for your own convenience, uh, it takes away your um, your independence, it takes away your freedom, essentially. So then the second issue that came up was if there are no apps on a device with the OS, the OS is practically useless. So we said that we will come up with, a, with one mechanism for installing apps on the device. Because the issue today is not about the apps that you trust. The issue is about you have no control over the apps that you don't trust. The apps that come default with the devices that you buy, you paid good money for. So we came up with this mechanism, what we call as PASS, which stands for Private App Store Services. And the idea behind that is you can choose 
a different app store and uh, depending on the reputation of the app store the apps available through the you know you get to trust the app store administrator and you get to trust the apps that come through the app store so that was kind of the second uh, mechanism uh, that we focused on the third is a little more um, uh, a little more technical in that sense what we looked at was how do the apps know that they are functioning in a device that is not been tampered with you know it's it's important for the apps to know that it's running in an os which is not been tampered with um it's important for the os to know um that it's running on a device uh, with the proper root, root of trust so we call that as a chain of trust environment so essentially baro is represents uh, three different things one is no default apps um number two is pass private app store services and the third is what i would call as chain of trust environment so this is you know this is the fundamental philosophy behind it it is essentially a linux distribution so we do have baro is working in routers we have baro is working in tablets we have baro is working in mobiles and uh, of course when it comes to the mobile ecosystem which is what i think this group is interested in the focus is fundamentally in terms of um, you know how do we provide the android compatibility how do we uh, integrate with uh, android open source framework you know things of that nature so um, i will basically uh, leave it at that that as a high level overview of what it is uh thank you mr kartik uh that is quite an interesting philosophy uh our group of panelists here they are quite accomplished uh, within the android open source project uh with custom roms uh, with the linux kernel and all so i think yeah. uh, we can get a bit technical with the panelist uh mr arin sinha uh, can you please uh, share your views on it since you have worked with a lot of oems before on to sure. you uh <clears throat> hello mr arya uh, very good good evening good uh, evening arjun i hope mm. you're doing well so a bit of short short introduction of myself you might have heard um i'm an android engineer i'm a founder of an indian operating system the same philosophy you are following so my question is what is bharo is based on and how is it different from android okay um since you have done custom roms you would be you know uh, familiar with uh, the android open source project right yeah obviously yeah. yeah so um android is kind of a misnomer because it means different things to different people the android essentially is just a framework it's a library and mm -hmm. it uh, in terms of the commercial distribution it also is essentially a linux distribution it happens mm -hmm. to be the world's largest linux distribution they made some uh, decisions you know in terms of using se linux and uh, using java um, you know using zygot um, they made some decisions in terms of uh, you know um, how the permission uh, system uh, works you know uh, but if you ignore all the noise that's out there android is essentially a linux distribution hmm. so the question that comes up is how do you manage android you know uh, not the os let us assume you would do your own custom kernel mm -hmm. then the issue becomes how do you manage the uh, you know if the users are used to using android apps how do you manage the android framework per se what is it that you can do you know uh, um so how is how is different from the android like uh, for example there are plenty of custom roms that are built in india and i also own one of them uh, it's called cypher os it it does not ship with google apps uh, does not ship with the proprietary applications which you just talked about we ship with the uh, in a vanilla variant with the open source applications that are yeah. uh, totally open source so how does bar os is different than all the alternative projects which are available in india okay i would say that uh, there's you know uh, um, the two ways of looking at it you know if you can uh, if you can conceptualize bar os as it having essentially two layers okay so one is what i would call a layer above the linux kernel but before the android um, you know starts okay, okay. the android framework starts 
And the second is about the Android framework in terms of installing apps within the Android framework and managing the apps within the Android framework. So that's kind of where the pass, the private app store comes from. Okay. No, but, but the similar exactly. private store services are already available on the uh, on the open yes. source applications for the Aurora yes. store, the Android store. So my, yes. my actual point is how are you guys making it different? Because the thing which you chose, the layer between the, when the Linux and the Android framework starts, that is handled by the bootloader, correct? And bootloader is supplied by um, MediaTek and Qualcomm for their devices. And for the Google Pixels, it is supplied by the Google itself. That's not an open source part. So how are you guys modifying it? Okay. We don't modify. We don't get into the, what do you say? We get in after it starts to boot. Okay. Because the first thing that gets loaded is the kernel. And yeah. uh, because you do custom ROM, you can load your own signed kernels. You know, you create a boot image or whatever, and you can, yeah. Yeah. You can load that, right? And uh, the once the kernel is loaded, mm -hmm. okay, um, before the uh, you know the init starts different services and things like that. So mm -hmm. we have elements both in the kernel as well as the the init services that start up. Okay. Okay. So, so similarly on the top side in terms of installing apps and things like that, you would say yes, there are alternate app stores, but the, the uh, I would say one of the fundamental differences is the way we looked at it was we wanted developers to directly be able to push apps into the device that once you trust a developer because currently the app stores they get to host their own apps yeah okay. so there is a mechanism of uh, app developers having to push their apps onto uh, you know which multiple app stores mm -hmm. we have taken a contra approach we basically say the developer shares their public key with us and then a developer hosts their own, um, you know, APKs, their apps. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, we check periodically uh, to see if the app has been updated. We have a, a very simple mechanism where we tell the developer to update, you know, when they have a, late, a newer version, which they publish, they just publish the metadata in a known location, known URL, mm -hmm. and we keep pulling that. So the way our app store works is essentially to manage the profiles of our devices yeah. so we don't necessarily host the app per se okay so okay. Okay. So the developer so, has complete freedom in terms of uh, they host their own apps and we just maintain a link to it and we maintain the what do you call the sha1 hash or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, we do the verification of the public key of that particular apk mm -hmm. so isn't this actually the same which android does because i have contributed to android too so in yeah. Android 2, I, I publish my own app on my own repository and I just provide provide the metadata and my sh one sim to the Android. And then I can yeah. in, include the Android Play Store in my, yeah. which we already include in the Cypress also. And that does the similar thing. And one more no, question regarding- Yeah, there's a slight difference. The slight difference is that uh, your app is basically, you are pushing your app to the app store. From the app store, it goes to the device. What we are talking about is us getting the app directly from the developer's you know, website. But, but more or less, you will you you are using an interface which talks between the user's URL, the developer's URL, and the device, correct? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. Uh, more or less, you're using an interface that talks to the device and the user's uh, and the developer's URL. With the app that's is correct. located. That's correct. That's correct. So the uh, you know the 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 difference is see it's more a philosophical difference than anything else. We don't want to take the responsibility of telling the user which um, you know which app developer or which app is good or bad or ugly. Right. Mm -hmm. That we leave it to the experts. They can curate apps. They can decide which apps are good, which ones are open source, which ones are closed source. We don't mm -hmm. get into that debate at all. We only provide a mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know for users to be able to choose, you know, uh, which app developer. So if there are five apps, um, all the five apps are on five different locations. We only provide, you can think of what we are doing as a customized, um, you know, profile management, if you want to call it that, okay? okay. Um, that every device, every user manages a profile in their pass. And uh, depending on what's on the profile, those apps get loaded onto the device. That's essentially what it is. So, okay. it, you know, it is just, you, you, you know, um, it is kind of similar to what Apple has now recently started talking about doing web 
um, they're talking about apps being hosted on websites of developers and things like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I understand that's very similar to the mechanism of Android works. Also, you mentioned that you 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 guys have modified the Linux kernel. So why yeah. not Bar OS is not open source yet because Linux has GPL licensing, which basically enforces anyone who uses Linux in their products to make it open source. We at Cypher OS also publish it publicly, and all the other projects who are from all over the world they also publish the Linux sources. So why yeah. it's not available yet? Yeah, it is not available because we have what I would call uh, um, organizational reasons. Okay, now the there are two parts, like you mentioned. One is uh, that if you do work on the in a kernel, uh, then yes, what you are saying is correct. But the kernel Linux kernel also provides mechanism to load uh, binary blobs into the kernel. I know, as an open source enthusiast, it's not uh, what do you say? It's not. Uh, it's not a good thing to do, but um, commercial realities are where you know when you work with media tech or you work with uh, any of no. the SOC vendors, you know no, you no. need to load stuff from the vendor partition. You no. need to you know you need to deal with non-open source uh, components. No, th that's totally fine. The, the, which you are talking about that you need to load the binaries from the vendor, but still yeah. both those binaries are not included in the corner source tree, so you can't. Uh, you are actually liable to publish that to the open source because the GPL licensing by Mr. Linus Torvalds, who is the founder of Linux, which basically states that you need to open source the kernel source tree. You 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 are not liable to release the Windows Media Tech or the Quick Qualcomm proprietary or Google Tensor proprietary uh, blob binaries and uh, blobs, but you are liable to release the kernel sources. And it is very disappointing to see that if you are planning to release an Indian OS and there is no transparency between the developers, users and the commercial team. Um, um, yeah, because even all the OEMs, like say Realme, Chinese OEMs, they, they use the MediaTek devices, they use the Qualcomm devices. They are also releasing it. So why not VAR OS is releasing it? Um, this is not a commercial point of view. We, are, we yeah, understand. Are you, I, I mean, I totally understand, you know, where you're coming from. Okay, I don't, you know, I don't get to make those decisions. Let me make that very simple. Now, in terms of others, you know, releasing their kernel sources and things like that, to me, that is also a little misleading because we work with, uh, you know, providers, the hardware providers, and our recommendation to them is to basically push that into mainline Linux. Okay, so I would say that wherever it is practically possible, uh, we encourage people to. Um, what you call uh, put the code in uh, in mainline because that helps everyone and it makes it what I would call future proof, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of uh, us working, uh, because uh, as you are aware, um, there are a lot of distributions, open source, custom ground distribution, and these are all very welcome things. Um, but for it to be sustainable, for it to become uh, successful, it needs to become commercial, commercially successful. It needs to yeah. gain, you know, wider adoption, and uh, that's one of the reasons um, uh, why I would say that uh, we need to walk a very fine line in terms of um, uh, balancing both sides. If if you are still using a downstream version, uh, Aryan, 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 Aryan. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, mm -hmm. We have other panelists as well. Uh, yeah. on, on to Jian. Uh, Jian, uh, we have a wonderful discussion right now going on. Uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, clarity has been show, showcased on Bar OS. Uh, can you share your opinion on that? Uh, good evening, Sir Ayla. Uh, sir Ayar. Uh, here is yes. my question about Bar OS. Bar OS. Um, you said it's running on private app store services. What if people want to use Google? as their primary services? Do they have an option to use Google or there's something else other than that? No, we, we, you know, we don't, we don't encourage that. And yes, I'm familiar with uh, the open G apps and the other, um, you know, other efforts that are going on. Um, if they want to use Google, we recommend that they go with uh, mainstream Android. Um, since uh, it's for every Indian, right? Um, since it's for every Indian, um, I think it's Google, Google is essential because um, most of the apps are required by Google services. But what what if 
people want to uh doesn't have Google services, but they want to use that for uh OS. See, those are um uh, you know there are no easy answers to that, right? Um, Google services essentially, you know, we believe collect a lot more data from you than they need to to provide the services that they do. Okay. Um, so that's, again, a business decision that they're perfectly entitled to make. And they've made that and they move in that direction. Um, for us, data privacy and data protection is the main um, is the main crux of what we're doing. Um, the ability to give uh, the people who use this uh, to make their own decision in terms of which apps they're able to load, which apps they can use, which apps they can remove, and ability to have more control uh, over the devices that they own. That is essentially where we come from, you know. So, uh, and we are not, uh, you know, as we are today, we're not really looking at the, what I would call as the consumer market, not yet, because it takes a long time to get to that stage. You know, um, Android itself, when it started, I would say, I think Google, if memory serves me right, it was acquired in 2007, and it was only in 2010, 2011, they started, uh, it started coming out, uh, into the mainstream and then it has taken off from there. So we realize that the you know operating system journey is not a it's not a short term thing. It's not something that you get in and uh, you know it happens. It's going to take its own time and we're going to have to uh, overcome a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, I would say one technical, two uh, social, um, uh, three commercial. You know, um, we've been very lucky in terms of there's been a lot of social acceptance for Bar OS. It seems to have resonated very well with a lot of people. And, um, uh, you know, we realize that puts a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. So we are balancing it because we need to make sure we, you know, we need to make sure we're around 10 years from now. And that's how uh, we would be able to make this successful. You know, so that's that's kind of uh, uh, what I would say, again, you know, going back to the philosophy in terms of our decision making process, that's how it is. Um, how can we know if Borrow is, is not collecting data from the users or us? Um, we don't need to collect any data, right? I mean, you know, um, people say you need telemetry data. Why do you need telemetry data? You know, um, uh, uh, OS is just a thin layer. Does the Linux kernel collect any data from people? No, it doesn't. It's the apps that collect data and it's the apps that send data to different servers out there. And it does, you know, all those things. So I would say, uh, you know, the crux of it is that do you own your digital life? If you don't, what what part of your digital life do you control at least, you know? Um, yes, people are used to different services and uh, most people probably may not understand or realize the uh, importance of owning their own data. But um, that's, you know, that's something that's kind of important to us and that's kind of been the a basis on which we started this journey. So data protection is the, you know, is the crux of what we, you know, what we stand for. Uh, that's a, a really enlightening answer, Mr. Karthik, because I do agree uh, that the Linux kernel obviously does not collect any data and that's a good philosophy. Uh, on to Mr. Pranav. Uh, Pranav, are you there? Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, can you share your, yes, you're audible. Uh, Mr. Karthik has uh, shared his opinions on this. What is your uh, view on it? Um, I would first like to start by asking what security myths do you think your OS has debunked or could debunk in the future? Uh, <laughs> no, that's a can of worms, right? Security myths. Um, uh, let's see. I would say that um, what we have is um, intentional complexity, you know, fundamentally. It's actually a very good question. It's making me think as we speak. Um, um, the fundamental thing about uh, uh, intentional complexity is that once you start using something, you start believing that's the only way of doing it, you know. Um, I mean, for example, uh, I think I use this example to people is uh, we all know that uh, when the Americans went to space, um, uh, you know, when they came back, uh, they were very proud of announcing the ballpoint pen. You know, they'd spent uh, millions of dollars um, because ink, when in zero gravity situation, ink doesn't flow to paper. 
So they came up with the ball point pen and they used that to write stuff in space, you know. And then some people went to the Russians and they basically asked them, you know, you guys also went to space, you know, what did you do? They said we used a pencil, you know. So uh, in terms of uh, security uh, myths, I will tell you the first security myth is that only large companies can provide data security for you. That's the first myth. Um, if you store your data in a USB drive, you remove the drive from any uh, digitally connected device. It's you know you get, it's the data is with you. If you're concerned about your data, uh, you know physically being damaged or lost or whatever, um, then you can encrypt the data and store it in you know somewhere on the internet. Um, there's I'm old school. You know I've been on the internet since 1989, so I would say that uh, protocols like SSH and RSync. Um, are more than sufficient. There are enough tools out there that can encrypt your data, maintain all the data, and then put it out there, and then you can synchronize it. So whatever device that you use, you'll be able to do that. So the first, uh, first and the only security myth I'd like to bust is that whatever solutions um, bug tech is providing, uh, they are intentionally complex, and you don't need that. Is that a good enough uh, thing, Pranav? Uh, yeah, it was a uh, very good. Uh, okay. Also, I uh, also I would like to ask, uh, uh, how has uh, Barvas's uh, development uh, been affected by your views? Um, like your views I'm, I'm on sorry, cyber security the question? Sense? Uh, how has bar versus yeah. development cycle been affected by your views on cybersecurity? Um, actually, it has had no impact because, uh, to be honest with you, if you need to support Android apps, you have to do it the you know Android way, um, and the Android way is not necessarily the most optimum way. Just to give you, um, because this is a technical audience, let me just get into that. Um, uh, there are only two, uh, two, and probably now these days only one module that Android uses. It's called the Binder module for IPC. You know that and Shared Memory are the two main uh, kernel modules that Android depends on. So, and uh, Binder is, um, you know, it comes because of uh, what I would call historical decisions of the BOS and things like that. Um, we all, you know, Linux already has a better IPC mechanism, you know, named pipes, for example. Um, why those were not used, I don't know. Um, so some of the decisions that were made in Android are intentionally complex in my view. Um, and if you simplify it, you're going to get better security, better you know reliability and all that. But then you know the world has moved in a very different uh, you know there were what I would call um, commercial considerations um, where those decisions were made. Uh, today, it's very easy for me to say that we're not going to do any uh, Android apps, right? Um, but then if you make a decision saying that you're not going to run Android apps, you're going to only run Linux apps, then end users are going to be affected by it because they're used to using devices in a certain way, you know? Um, so yes, um, uh, will we get to untangling, um, you know, this intentional complexity? I hope so. But that would require uh, time and, um, you know, uh, what I would call a market respect, I suppose. And that's going to happen. I hope it happens. Uh, I uh, think uh, we should go back to Mr. Uh, Aryan. He's been edging on to uh, uh, clear a few doubts of his. Aryan, you are. Okay. Uh, so, uh, one more question from my side. Uh, yeah. You said that um, you, you took the USB, uh, you implemented your own uh, the interface on it uh, uh, with some NP developed changes. Um, so I saw in one of your conferences uh, in which you were displaying the screenshots of the Bar OS, I saw Android keyboard as a pre-installed default keyboard app. So if you are trying to make an alternative to everything, uh, why have haven't you guys moved towards your own system apps and still using the which Android chips? That's a you know I mean that's a good point. Um, 
our view is that if there are open source or even closed source developers out there who have developed these modules and uh, you know we have no problem bundling those uh, system apps as part of the solution that we offer to customers um i would say that the the focus for us has always remained on the os side not necessarily on the app side or the user experience side while we understand those things um we in fact even have uh, i would say we have had requests for people saying that you know so much about security why don't you do a messaging uh, messaging uh, ecosystem or app system or whatever yes we have certain ideas in terms of how that, that can go um but practically speaking uh, it's going to take some time before that happens you know um for example uh my view of what an end user needs to do uh on what an app developer does is essentially it's just identity and data so if you can provide a common service where identity and data are interlinked and uh, developers can just do a http in and http out to the data and they don't really care where it goes where it ends up um yeah you may have a what i would call a utopia world where the user gets to own their data again um but that's a tall order in terms of how it comes out and when it comes out so we need to make baby steps towards you know in that direction okay uh one uh, of the final questions on my side yeah um so as you said that you are considered not mainline right so you are using a downstream fork of uh linux kernel correct yeah that's correct <clears throat> so uh what makes you think that it cannot be open sourced because um uh, i myself have worked with the various oems and i currently work on the stock rom development for one of them smartphone brand and we also use the downstream kernel versions we are shipping 5.10 and mainline is i think 6.2 i think so yeah. um we also release those downstream versions because it makes more sense because to respect the licensing licensing of the linux kernel so yeah. um um my question is again that why you, even I, you know, I, it's like longer, this i yeah. i agree i agree with you on a personal basis but when it comes to uh, what i would call legal or commercial decisions those are defined by contracts you yeah know, but 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 it's but, as simple but, as that so but, it varies it varies from um uh, you know oem to oem device manufacturer to device manufacturer it you know i can't there, there isn't one single uh, formula that works across for example even the bootloader right mm -hmm. um the if you look at the industry they've gone you know it started with u boot okay yes and uh, android called it a boot why they called it a boot only god knows okay yeah. and uh, in u boot if you look at how it has evolved or how it has morphed uh, it's again it's a big hairball today does it need mm -hmm. to be as complex as it is no it doesn't have to be but then can you change the bootloader you can't and if you look at the soc vendors they moved more in terms of um they've gotten into what are known as preloaders and yes. uh, you know it's a it's not a happy situation right it's not mm -hmm. a simple situation um so we need to work with that you know um as yeah. much as you know you yeah. personally like it and we personally you know i may personally like it um mm -hmm. there is what i would call uh, you know being pragmatic about uh, the decisions we make Mm -hmm. yeah but even from the commercial point of view you are not uh, uh requested advice to release uh, those uh, u boot sources but uh, you can just release the kernel tree but and nevertheless uh, i think that um uh, that may change in your future or uh, after this conference maybe some i, I hope so will... yes yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so we can see and also what all devices are with support as of now see as of now um i would say the um processors you know um we worked with uh, uh mediatek processors we have worked mm -hmm. with um uh spectrum process unisoc processors yeah. um, we have worked with uh, qualcomm processors um you know and so it's basically with the reference de designs of the socs we are able to work with them okay any plans shipping it to, uh, shipping power is in near future 
Uh, see, that is a, you know, I mean, unfortunately, it's a commercial decision, right? It's not mm -hmm. a, um, uh, you know, so currently solutions of, uh, you know, borrower solutions are going in uh, what I would call uh, closed, uh, you know, private networks. Okay. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so we can uh, shift to uh, Jian. Uh, do you have anything to add to the discussion, Jian? Um, here is my quest last question for my side. Um, what are your goals to reach the expectations of every users that use your product or the bar OS? Ah, uh, boy. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, you know, I would say, you know, if I were to say it in simple terms, you know, I want every user to own their digital identity. I want them to own their digital life. I want them to own their own data. And I want them to make the decision whether they share it with others or not, you know. Um, and uh, BarOS is, in my view, the first step towards that independence, you know, um, owning your own digital. Uh, basically, you need to own your own ID, you know. Uh, that's that's how I look at it. All right. I think uh, the panelists here are done with their questions. Uh, Mr. Karthik, we had mentioned that we have about a 2 lakh a strong uh, community. And uh, they were quite eager to ask the questions on. Obviously, we cannot take 2 lakh questions. In. Uh, so we have taken down a few questions. Uh, I hope you can uh, share your views and uh, answer them to their satisfactions. Uh, sure. Ayan. You are. Uh, hello, Mr. Kartik. Thank you for joining in today. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, so here are some questions the community wanted to ask. How did you get involved in Android development? Have you previously worked on any AOS2 projects or is this your inaugural project in this domain? Um, this is in, you know, in AOSP, this is inaugural. I've been observing how it has evolved from 1.0 days, but not, uh, not on a, you know, technical manner, uh, technical manner. I would say it's only been in the last, uh, three, four years, I suppose. Uh, I see. Uh, so another question was. I have, I mean, you know, in terms of my open source contributions, I've done some contribution to uh, Dropbear, which is a SSH server, and that's distributed widely in um, uh, what you call, uh, you know, on the internet, I suppose. A lot of embedded devices have them. Um, um, there's some stuff on my GitHub, I suppose, some Python code and things like that. Uh, but yeah, I... Uh, I would say that I come from a background where I understand uh, uh, it's old school, so I understand things at a low level. Um, uh, okay, so moving on. The second question was, BarOS as a project affiliated with IIT gained significant attention upon its announcement some time ago. However, there were no public samples or opportunities for beta or alpha testing. Was this decision intentional? Yes, it is intentional um, because uh, when we do anything in public, the expectations are very high. For example, we never considered, um, um, you know, um, uh, it's uh, we never considered a consumer um, rollout or we never anticipated that consumers would be very eager to uh, get used to this. Um, but we realize, uh, you know, we realize today that uh, that is something that we need to be working on, and we are working on that. Um, uh, and it is a tall order um, because, as you're aware, uh, consumer devices uh, they get paid for loading an OS. And uh, our value proposition is we are going to the people who are making the devices and saying you pay us. So they look at it as a double penalty, you know. Um, so it is not an easy, uh, what do you call? It? It's not an easy thing to crack into. You know, even if consumers are willing to pay us directly, um, you know, uh, the electronic manufacturing is a volume game. So unless, let us say, we make a million de devices, um, then you're not going to be cost competitive in terms of... So the user's expectation is, you know, we want to be able to go out and buy a 5,000 or a 7,000 or a 10,000 rupee phone, and we want bar OS in it. Um, that is, uh, technically, it's possible. Practically, 
it requires, you know, uh, we need to be in a different league for us to be able to do that. I've been on some public stages and I said, if someone has $200 million to spare, please contact us. You know, we'd love to, you know, launch a phone with Baro, isn't it? So that's kind of where that is. Also, why do you think Baroes gained such a widespread interest in the tech community? I, I think it resonates well with two things, you know. Number one, what it stands for, you know, um, we don't want your data. You need to own your own data, you know, own your ID, own your data. And uh, people are tired of all the apps that are coming on the phone and even what they call plain vanilla versions and things like that. It comes with more apps than people need, number one. And number two, um, I, you know, I, I would always say, look at, look at a situation where usually when, you know, people who have laptops, they'll call their grandson or their nephew or whatever to come and fix it for them, install this, do this, do that. That's how the world works. And, uh, you know, why can't you do that for your Android phone? You can't, you know? Uh, so I would say the two things that actually resonated well with people, the first one was no default apps. And uh, the second was, uh, private app stores. Um, because people at some level, they realize that it's all about independence, you know, um, that they're no longer dependent on these companies and their policies and, you know, uh, for them to own their ident their digital identity and their data. That's essentially what it is. I think so. The, the, data, the data protection thing you said, uh, many customers like Graphene OS, have already done it in the past. How is it? How is it? How is ParOS different from anything like Graphene OS or Lineage OS? See, I um, Graphene OS is uh, Graphene uh, Lineage. These are all wonderful projects, right? Um, um, and uh, um, they have done some extremely good technical work, you know. Um, but it it remains a niche because it is focused on. Um, uh, what do you say? What I would call people who are technically extremely sound to be to benefit from it. And I think there are a few organizations out there that you know that do graphene OS loading and selling devices with that or whatever, and that is good. Uh, our view is that um, uh, the OS is not number one. It's not restricted just to mobiles. It's there in routers. It's there in you know anything uh, anything that needs an OS. You can use the same principles. Um, or, uh, devices that don't need a UI and human interaction um, can benefit from the same things, you know, same philosophies, you know, no telemetry, no, uh, you know, fast boot, um, making sure that the data is yours, uh, ability to install apps remotely through a centralized mechanism. These are all things that uh, uh, are built, I mean, can be built on top of Linux. Uh, we don't see any other distribution that has kind of tried to focus on what I would call this approach, you know, so um, that's that's where we think Bar OS is different. Will you be also working on a laptop OS like one that can run on uh, it is uh, x86 platforms? See, uh, um, I would like to, you know, if you ask me a time frame for when that would happen, I would say I, you know, I can't really because um, it's it's a matter of. Uh, what do we prioritize first? You know, um, we chose mobiles because that's a device that everyone uses all the time. Um, laptops are definitely uh, something that we are looking at, but uh, we have not invested the resources required to uh, make it work in that. Right? It is a, it is what I would call it requires a different uh, different uh, you know I mean different user experience and it requires a different set of decisions. Um, but yes, you know, uh, we do think uh, there is potential uh, uh, to do that. Uh, also, uh, when Varos was initially announced, the demo was shown on Pixel. And Pixel phones usually allow logged bootloader even on custom rooms. So you can ensure that the integrity was working with Varos when it was on a pixel, but how will it work on different phones? Like that's correct. So that that is where working with the phone manufacturers is important. You know, I think um, um, the 
uh, the way it works is that uh, the secure bootloaders, um, while people, uh, while different device manufacturers have different implementations of how they do what they call as verified boot, you know, um, that is something that we are dependent on the device manufacturers to support. Mm, lastly, could you clarify how frequently borrowers will receive updates? And given Google's pre periodic QPR, QPR releases, containing significant OS level changes, will borrowers incorporate those updates as well? See, what we do, uh, um, Google has a release cycle which does both uh, security updates and feature updates. Okay. Um, so the uh, security updates, uh, uh, basically because our bar OS is deployed in closed user group networks, um, we evaluate what uh, security risks are applicable to them and apply uh, apply those updates, you know, push those updates at the earliest possible thing. Um, it's, uh, there isn't any synchronized mechanism in the world today for um, pushing updates uh, as soon as a security issue is made, you know, uh, is made public, let us say. Um, there are various reasons for that. A um, lot of organizations are doing a lot of good work, um, but there's no coordinated um, you know, mechanisms for doing that. And the reason for that is primarily because the Android ecosystem is, uh, you know, is quite fragmented um, because you have the SOC vendors, then you have the ODMs, um, and then, you know, uh, you have uh, people like us, Bar OS. So we need to coordinate with everyone to make sure uh, that the updates work well on the devices, the platforms that we support. Uh, so, will UPI straight up work on VarOS? Var OS? Uh, UPI does work. Um, it depends on the app uh, because some of the uh, UPI apps have dependency on Google services. Those apps don't work. But the oh. apps that do not, do not have dependency on Google services, uh, they do work. So, apps like Paytm works, but Google Pay doesn't. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. I, you know, I don't want to either endorse one app or the other in UPI, but I can only say that uh, UPI works. You know, we, we have we have demonstrated it to people. So, oh yes. Uh, okay, uh, I think we should wrap up here. Uh, Leonardo, you are. Uh, can you please do the word of thanks? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so on behalf of the entire organizing committee, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to everyone who made this panel discussion of Bar OS a resounding success. Anjanea, Agampreet, Ayan, Yash, and everyone else from the organizing committee without whom this panel would not be possible. First and foremost, we are thankful to Mr. Kartik Ayar, director of JNK Ops, for his acceptance of our invitation to be a panelist. We deeply appreciate his willingness to share his pioneering expertise on this platform. <clears throat> we are immensely grateful to our panelists who join us. Aryan Sena, Pranav Talmale, Saniv Seti, and Gian Paolo Estacio for taking the time to share their invaluable insights on Bar OS. Your in-depth knowledge and diverse perspectives truly enriched the discussion and provided our audience with a comprehensive understanding of this indigenous mobile operating system's technical merits. We would also like to express our sincere appreciation to our moderator, Yash Reddy, for his skilled facilitation and thought-provoking questions, which kept the discussion engaging and informative throughout. Our special thanks to our sponsors, Xiaomi, for their generous support, and our media partners, Troy Den, TechCoran, Agam's Tech Tricks, and the YouTube Revan's extended community for their promotional efforts, which help us reach a wider audience. Thank you.
Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, uh, Mr. Karthik. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.